next Saturday. Christmas comes early. Unbelievable. Welcome to this incredible scene. Bills. To the end zone. Chargers. It's a touchdown. An exclusive NFL game. That's fantastic. Live in primetime. Wow. Only on Peacock. With a Christmas gift to their fans. They're having some fun now. Bills versus Chargers. Next Saturday, 7.30 Eastern. Exclusively on Peacock. Hello and welcome to The Paddock in the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. In episode 135 and part two with Lisa Kitely, the England head coach chats about tough times living in bubbles, the Ashes and the World Cup in New Zealand where England reached the final. Lisa discusses what England need as a team to challenge the mighty Australians along with her thoughts on the future of the women's game. A 360-degree view of her life as England's head coach since her appointment in late 2019. It wasn't the easiest start for you, though. With uh, You had the T20 World Cup where England uh, got knocked out because of that rain rule in the semi-final, but then you got struck by the, the global pandemic. How, how difficult was it? Well, how difficult has it been handling bubble life? Yeah, it's um, it ha- hasn't been what I envisaged, <laughs> to be <laughs> totally honest. Um, going into the T20 World Cup with a month and a half prep is not ideal, but I was lucky. As I said, I knew a lot of the players. Uh, we took a little bit. We put pressure on ourselves again because we lost our first game to South Africa. Uh, which meant uh, we had to play pretty good cricket moving forward. And I felt like in the T20 World Cup, towards the back end, we are just really starting to play good T20 cricket. We get to Sydney, SEG, and we get a washout. Um, We were going in to play India in a really good place. The team was um, playing well. And I was pretty confident we could have beaten India. But when you... um, Competition, cricket, World Cups, you know, um, if you get yourself in the wrong position and you're not that one or two teams going into the semis, you leave yourself open. Um, Obviously, no reserve days um, was uh, not helpful. And I think moving forward, they've corrected that and that won't ever happen again. So that's great. Um, And then I I move over to England and um, within a month, Uh, we've got COVID, (laughs) Um, which means um, I don't get home for seven months. Um, I'm married, um, which was never on the cards when I, when we discussed the job, uh, we were going to catch up every three months, Singapore, Dubai, um, come over for the summer. And it was really exciting. Um, And then we get, uh, I get to England and I can't get back for seven months. Uh, The next time I get back is another seven months. And then this year leading into the World Cup in New Zealand, it was eight months. Um, So uh, me personally, it's been uh, quite a challenge um, not being able to uh, see my wife. Um, But uh, for the players and bubble life, um, it's been really challenging. I think uh, players and staff have struggled um, individually. I think everyone would say at some stage they've struggled um, being in bubble life Um, and it's even last year in the summer we're in a bubble so you couldn't have family or or partners in at the hotel so even though some players were in England they didn't actually see their partners or fiancés um, for like um, the whole summer um, so that has a toll, and I think um, uh, we all know we need to get on with it, and we're really lucky in what we do, and we try and make the best of it. Um, and we still really enjoy – we've still really enjoyed playing cricket over the last two years, um, but it has had its toll on individuals uh, um, in different ways. Um, but um, we all are really aware that um, – we're really lucky to do what we do and in the big scheme of things um, across the world, it, it's been, everyone's had challenges and um, that's probably, 
a two years that we're all happy to get through and hopefully out the other side and back to a bit more normality and crowds and people can come on tour and um, be at matches. So I think small things, um, we we are aware of big things, uh, you know, world pandemic, there's been a lot of tragedy and, and death and um, sadness. So um, we had a good time through in it, but it, it has been a hard time. But I'd say most individuals over the last two years have probably had some adversity and had their own challenges, um, and we're no different. Well, thank you for, for that. It must have been tough for you after not being able to go back for such a, a long period of time. It it was even worse because I actually come from uh, I live in Perth now and Perth had locked down and you couldn't even <laughs> get in. And, and then you go back and you've got a quarant like, so you have a month off, right? You quarantine in a hotel for two, um, two weeks and then you, you're lucky to get 14 days and then you've got to come back. But um, it's not what I signed up for, um, but that's how it was. Um, I've been lucky to coach England um, but me personally that that was probably my challenges um, that I couldn't get back home and when I did you got a max for maybe 10 to 14 days after you do your 14 days hotel quarantine but I can tell you I reckon I've had at least four and a bit months in hotel hotel quarantine and um, if anyone's done it um, that's always tricky as well but I'm lucky um, the common the Olympic Games was on one of them. So the last Olympics asked me what happened, and I reckon I could tell you because I watched nearly <laughs> every day of it. it. Was hilarious. Well, let's move on to some cricket. Um, you had uh, obviously a, a busy winter with the Ashes and the World Cup. Now the Australians are an incredible side, but not winning the test match um which was a, a wonderful game of cricket we were chasing what two five seven and we finished 12 short did that have a big effect on the the three one day international which followed yeah definitely i think um going into the ashes we knew australia was strong um but we were we were quite confident that we could um play some good cricket and challenge them and hopefully get ourselves in a position to win matches. Um, and I think the first T20, we did that. We put them under pressure and they had to get, they batted extremely well and they got the runs and we didn't, we probably had our poorest bowling performance in T20 in the last two years. Um, but that that's what good teams do, right? And then we got washed out um, for two T20s going into the test match. Um, obviously we'd just played India and we performed pretty well in that. And we we're quite happy with the way we went about playing that test match when you don't play test cricket that often. Um, it does take a while to work out what to do and how you're going to approach it and get in the right mindset. So we're confident that, um, we had that experience and we played quite well. So, um, we were pretty clear on how we wanted to play against Australia um, and uh, we were under the pump a bit and Heather Knight batted brilliantly and got us into the test match and Catherine Brunt with the ball. I think they were two key players who kept us in that test match and when we needed something to happen with the ball, uh, Catherine was brilliant and when we were in trouble with the bat, um, Heather Knight had an amazing innings um, and we got to a place that we needed a declaration and Australia gave it to us. Um, and we always knew if we got a chance, we we're going to go for it. Um, and I don't think when Australia went out there, they really thought that we could have won that test match. Um, but the way we batted um, and we took it to them, um, we should have won it. <laughs> um, and then it just, within this is what I've noticed in my coaching career in women's and in men's test match. You can have an hour, a crazy hour, where it just turns things on its head uh, and we were coasting to win that test match and then we had that crazy hour where Australia did a few different things that our players hadn't experienced and that was they started to bowl 
uh, really wide so we couldn't hit the ball, which is it's legal. And then they were um, bowling a lot more bounces over our head so we couldn't hit the ball because we needed basically a runner ball there for a while um, in probably the last 10 overs. And we didn't adapt quick enough to that situation um, and we could have let the ball go a bit more. Um, Australia got warned that they needed to bring it back in and they couldn't bowl the lines that they were bowling, so they would have come back into us. Um, and we needed um, probably Nat Siva was key. Um, and if she stayed to the end, I, I thought she would have controlled the innings um, to win us a match, but she didn't. <laughs> and then in the end, um, I suppose we got to the last wicket um, Kate Cross turned around and said, what am I doing? And I said, um, I saved the test match. Um, I felt 12 runs was a lot, um, even though we were going so well. But I felt if we lost the test match, we don't have a chance of winning the Ashes. Um, most people would say, well, you'd have to beat Australia three times, but we still had a chance. Um, we drew drew the test, um, and I think after that test match, um, the girls had put so much in. Um, they were pretty flat. Um, we knew we'd have to make changes soon because our players with the load were starting. We had a lot of niggles. Um, we had the World Cup coming up. Uh, we couldn't risk big injuries, um, so we had to make changes in the one-day games and Australia were too strong I think once we started to make changes and um, they've got a lot of match winners and um, I think after that Ashes we saw how far Australia are in front of the rest of the pack um, which meant going into that World Cup um, they were definitely going in as favourites um, and uh, showed why they hadn't lost the game in the last four years in 50 over cricket. Well, they, you know, they had that amazing streak of, was it 27? 26, 27 games, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, 27 games. And they showed, I suppose, in the Ashes, um, they've got a lot of depth. They've got a lot of match winners and they've got a lot of depth where they can rotate um, and keep players fresh. And uh, I don't think at the... At this moment, we've got as much depth where we can, we where we can do that. Well, as a I don't know if that ans- answered your question, but oh, I think um, it did. That it was, was our very that insightful. Was our ashes, yeah. I think that was our as ashes a experience. Yeah, I think as a cricket fan, you, you and someone who's played cricket, you know, you you always notice momentum, and 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 if you put a lot of effort into something, and then you narrowly lost that match or narrowly didn't win, then it's hard then to come back. And then, of course, with the World Cup, you lost, England lost the first three matches. How then did you lift the team? They've then, then lost six one-day internationals in a row, several of them <laughs> narrowly, but that must have been difficult then for you and the team to lift themselves. Yeah, it was really tough. I think um, the Ashes... On reflections, uh, if you had your preference, you wouldn't do two big events back to back. The Ashes in in cricket is a big event because of the format, um, and be- because you're, you're generally playing the number one team in the world. And if they're not number one, they're pretty close to it. <laughs> so you know you're going to have a really tough competition. And then going straight into um, the World Cup. And you went into um, bubble again, didn't you? Into New yeah, we went, we went into a bubble again for 10 days, but then we got all excited because we got let out three days earlier. So we were allowed out um, in seven days. Um, and for me, it was definitely obvious we had a bit of a knock-on effect from um, the ashes uh, where uh, people were flat, um, tired and... Uh, a lot of our batters were actually not in very good nick, um, as in they hadn't got um, too many runs against Australia and spent time in, in the 
in the crease. So they definitely sowed some demons going into the World Cup and batters especially felt like they needed time in the middle um, to build that momentum, like you said, and confidence back up from having um, a hard ashes campaign. And then we get to the World Cup and we play in Australia again, <laughs> first game. Uh, and I think we we put in a really good performance there. Um, we bowled well up front and then our back end, our last 10 went for 100, <laughs> which is not ideal, which meant we put a lot of pressure on our batters having to chase, I think, what was it, 310 or 3 You thought we did 12, didn't you? 12 yeah, I think it was 310, I think. Um, and we gave it a, a really good effort, a bit like the test match, a bit out of our reach, as in not the normal score you think you're chasing, but the girls started really well. Nat Siver got 100 um, and, you know, we're almost there but not quite chasing that score. That's probably the way it's going to go. Um, so that was we we nearly had gone two months without winning. <laughs> I think um, any person who's in a team and when you don't win, um, you're just searching for that win, aren't you, to get back, back a bit of belief, but the confidence um, and a bit of momentum to get into a competition. And then we obviously had uh, South Africa. We fielded really, a uh, West Indies, we fielded really poorly, put ourselves under pressure. Um, and we didn't win that. Then we had South Africa where it's getting really tight. We know we need a win there. Everyone knew they were, had a really good team and we're going to threaten in this World Cup. Um, same thing, fielded really poorly, dropped key people. Those, those batters went on and got big scores, put ourselves under pressure, uh, went back out, obviously feeling pressure of knowing we need to win, um, didn't get the performance we wanted. Um, so after South Africa, I don't think you could get a more flat dressing room. <laughs> Ashes, World Cup's not going the way we want. Um, media's obviously starting, which they should. They have an opinion. They see cricket. Um, um, so that's ramping up. Um, and we knew we play India next. Going to be a tough game there, um, definitely a good team um, and we needed to play some good cricket. Um, but the whole way through that, I could I could tell certain things were coming together. We started to slightly feel a bit better. Batters were spending more time at the crease. Our bowlers um, were performing well and keeping us in games. Our batting was probably not where we needed it. Um, and we just sort of really trained really hard, tried to get away from cricket when we can and started to really enjoy what we do and whatever happens, let's enjoy it, um, go out relaxed and, and play how we can play. And I was confident that we hadn't played our best cricket and if we play our best cricket, we can win and turn it around. So going into India um, was do or die, um, just got the players to relax. Uh, we trained really hard and put in what we needed to do there and then try to get them away and freshen up mentally to come back in for India. Um, and we did that and we we nailed it. And that's all, um, that game was the turning point for us. That's all we needed um, to get the team up and going again and getting that momentum. And when you've got to win every game or you're out of a World Cup, I mean, you know what you've got to do. You've got to turn up and you've got to be on. So I think just getting that win against India Everyone had a sigh of relief, the players. Um, and then it was like, right, we can do this. We can get back into the tournament. And I was really proud of the girls and the staff to be able to do that um, because we were definitely under the pump. Um, um, but it was a really brilliant effort to turn it around and get to the final. Yeah, you were playing knockout cricket thereafter in, in, from game four, weren't you then? Uh... Yeah, we needed to win five. Five on the bounce. And I did know we had potentially an easier run into the finals where we could get that bit of momentum and players spending longer at the crease um, before we get into a hopefully a semi. Um, 
So that probably helped in our favour, knowing that we had a good run into the final where we were playing teams that we, we should beat and players would be able to have get that time in the middle bowling um, spells that they needed. Like Catherine Brunt, from the Ashes to the World Cup, um, it was a massive ask. You know, she's our oldest player. Um, she bowled most overs out of everyone um, in our team from a bowling perspective other than probably Sophie Eccleston. Um, and she she started really, uh, she, she found it really hard to get back into it after the Ashes and she just wasn't bowling um, how she normally does, which was extremely frustrating. Um, but for her, those games gave her opportunity bit less pressure because you can probably get away with a little bit more bowling to um, some of the other teams than what you can to uh, the top the top teams um, to get her back into it because uh, she's a big part of um, the bowling unit. And then moving on to the final, what are your thoughts on the final? We lost by 71 runs, but it was a fabulous game of cricket and a great advert for the women's game. Yeah, the semi we we nailed and that helped us moving into the final. Everyone was in a really good spot. Um, there was no doubt, all the talk. It's a bit like the All Blacks, isn't it? Australia were um, dead set favourites. Um, so that played into our hands a little bit, took a little bit of pressure off. Um, the pitch was really good and we s- deliberated a lot about what we should do. Um, if we should bat and bowl um, and then in the ashes, the only way we put pressure on Australia was by bowling first and getting a few early wickets um, and that's the only way we put pressure on them and put them under the pump. Um, so we we took, we went with that. Um, we didn't get the early wickets. We dropped Healy and Haynes on 40 um, and the rest was history. They they put on a score that was um, going to be really hard to beat. Um, but in saying that, uh, I think chasing that score in a final, Nat Siva was brilliant again. The way she batted was amazing. Um, and when you look back on it, they, they, they were too good. Um, they played exactly how they've played um, in the last four years. Um, we didn't take our chances. Um, and they were definitely too good on the day. And are they the best women's cricket side of all time? They'd go very close. Um, where I think they're at at the minute where other teams probably need to catch up is um, they've got a lot, so many match winners. They don't rely on too many people. Um, and within a game, they can tactically make Um, they have a lot of options. For example, um, the left-handers against Sophie Eccleston um, makes a huge difference and they're able to manipulate games tactically through options and I think most teams don't have as many options throughout a game that they do. I mean, you look at their bowling lineup. I think they've got eight bowlers, so they've got a lot of all rounders. They've got left. They've got uh, you know off spinners. They've got left arm. They've got leggies. Um, so within that game, they can tactically do match ups throughout a whole fifty overs, where not many teams can do that with, and they can do it with bat and ball, um, and not many teams have that luxury of um, that many tactical options throughout a game and so for that's, in, that's, for in, for in, that's sorry for England you said uh, all earlier that England need to improve their depth to be able to match Australia yeah definitely oh, look most teams will have to improve their depth um, and their options within your team so I think with England at the moment what we would really like is um, you know a seam a couple of seam all-rounders. We've got a lot of spinning all-rounders, but to give us options on some pitches or uh, countries that we go to, um, to have 
the same options that that you know a, a batter who can bat you know from five to seven that is a genuine quick um, would be lovely and I think that's what we're looking for um, we've got options with the ball from a spinning point of view um, we've got a couple of great like Charlie Dean at the moment is a really good little offie um, but what we need to do is to be able to for her to be able to bat in the top six you know Sophie Eccleston is showing signs but she's um, probably not in your top six um, so we need a depth, a little bit more depth in our um, all round seam all rounders, and we've got two um, seam bowlers up front who who've been great um, servants to England, Catherine Brunt and Enya Shrubsole. Enya's just retired, um, and Catherine, um, I'm not speaking out of tune here. Um, she's not going to go on forever, so um, we need. Uh, proper quicks coming through which we definitely um, have a few of those so it's probably having a look at what we've got there um, and to have those quicks would be great um, and our death hitting at the back in 50 over cricket we're falling behind so we need to make sure that um, you know players from five six seven and even your eight um, can hit they've got good boundary percentage. So there's a couple of areas where um, we need to look at and taking wickets up front, um, death hitting at the back and having uh, a few more all-rounders as options would be um, moving forward what we what we would be looking at. Well, thanks for that summary. Uh, I, I will conclude with a final question about women's cricket, but I've actually got a question for you. Um, someone you actually played against who's been on on this podcast and also a friend of mine and one of them is Catherine Leng who uh, played against you <laughs> and she, she did. I did a podcast with her and she also did a podcast last year when um, we reviewed the India test match and and also a friend of mine called Lois Hopkins who's uh, um, captain of my local club's women's team the March Marvels and they both asked funny enough if you weren't working in cricket, what other sport would you work in? What other sport would I work in? Well, say hello to Lengi. She's a good friend and I do see her regularly around the cricket, um, cricketing games. Um, she was playing so a she, game this year. Um, I, I, she, she? Emailed me to say, she emailed me to say she was playing, um, but I haven't heard how she got on yet, but I am going to chase her up on that. <laughs> no, she's a, a great a great girl. I love playing against Langi um, through my playing years and I've kept in contact with her since I've been over here. Um, it's good catching up with her, so say hello. Um, what game? Do you know what? Um, it's a good question. I think I, I love watching tennis. Um, so working in tennis would be pretty cool. And since the bubbles, I'm well into my golf. Um, because when we were in bubbles, the only way we could get out of the hotel is if you played golf. Um, so every when I first started, I think there was two players that played golf, and now there's probably only two people in our whole management and playing group that don't play golf. Um, so I'd love to work in golf. That would be cool too. Well, thanks for ask, answering the question. I can imagine being in the bubbles you've been in. Any, any chance to get outside of a hotel room must be uh, must be something something exciting. I think. Yeah, well, golf was very exciting, and before that, I didn't think golf was very exciting at all. Now, women's cricket, we, we've had the fair break. We've had the T Twenty Challenge in in India. We've got the Commonwealth Games. We've got the hundred, which is going to be even stronger this year with the Australians coming over. Where do you see women's cricket going in the next five, ten years? Uh, I think T20 will play a massive part. Um, it looks like test cricket is getting a bit of uh, resurgence, which is great. I was a bit worried about where test cricket would fit in women's cricket, but now that we're playing multi-format, series I think that can keep 
T20, uh, sorry, test match going in women's cricket, which is great. But it's all about T20 uh, franchises. Uh, I see the IPL, I think, will be with us very soon and will be very exciting. Um, the fair break was um, brilliant to see um, opportunities for those players that probably would never be picked up in a franchise competition. I think that was a stepping stone for um, a lot of players in a lot of countries, which was great. And from the girls, uh, the players that went out from England, um, they totally enjoyed the fair break for that connection with other countries that they've never um, played against or um, had the opportunity to mingle with different countries and uh, they're very appreciative of potentially what they get compared to listening to some of the countries and what they have to do to play cricket. Um, so the fair break, um, I hope, continues um, for that reason. Um, IPL, I think once that happens, watch out, India is going to be uh, very tough and even stronger than what they are now. Um, WBBL 100 and IPL will drive and move women's cricket forward even more than what it is now. I enjoyed the fair break because I've spoken to Roberta Moretti Avery from Brazil a few times on this podcast. I know how much she was looking forward to playing in the fair break. Uh, and there is another one, I think, in Hong Kong next year. Well, I think, wasn't it meant to be in Hong Kong? The first one was supposed to be in Hong Kong, yes. And they... Yeah, yeah. No, I think that'd be, um, I think for the other countries, um, the fair break uh, would be fantastic. The other exciting thing is the under-19s World Cup because I think there's something like 20-odd teams going to that, countries playing in the under-19s. Um, so that that's going to really push cricket in a lot of countries forward as well, having a seniors and a 19s World Cup. Well, women's cricket certainly come a long way from when you first uh, started uh, playing cricket. Yeah, the journey's been amazing to watch. Um, to where it is now um, I just feel really fortunate to still be working in it and to experience some of the stuff that's happening now um, from a coaching side compared to when I was playing the um, transitions been amazing but as a player I still think I'd rather have played in my era and I think that's for a number of reasons one I still had a work outside cricket wasn't my job so if I was performing badly or not, it didn't really matter if I got dropped because I was just going to go back to work on Monday anyway, where I think the pressures now, if it's your career, it, they're starting to realise what the men and the pressures that the men can be put under because it's your livelihood now, isn't it? If, if you don't get that contract, you know, what are you doing? Um, and then the other bit, without social media, I think we had a lot more fun than what they do now. And for once, uh, with a guest, we can't thank um, any members of the family and we can't say thanks. It's all down to your your brothers while you are now the England women's cricket coach. <laughs> no, it's my, my cousin probably started that off for me, so I can thank her, that's for sure. Um, but um, my brothers and my dad, I wish they've got nothing. I can't thank them for much other than... We're a great family and I love them to bits, but on the sporting field, cricket-wise, terrible. But they were good sportsmen, just not cricket. They played football, basketball, and they were pretty good at that. Well, the other person I need to mention on this podcast is uh, Melanie Fair, a friend of mine in Perth, who introduced you to me to uh, join me on the, the paddock and the pavilion this morning. Um, Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, you've got a very busy summer ahead. I, I, I didn't realise, but you're, England are playing South Africa, Sri Lanka, India and New Zealand in one summer. Um, we've got the Commonwealth Games. Yes. yes uh, even we, we, yeah. we, we're not playing 
uh, New Zealand. I think the England women's A teams playing New Zealand in their warm ups to the Commonwealth Games. But wow. we, we definitely do have South Africa in a multi format series. We have the Commonwealth Games and then we have South Africa. Oh, sorry, we have um, India three ODIs, three T20s at the end of the summer. So um, isn't it brilliant, you know? There's so many more games these days. I, I will slide back. My first year playing for Australia, we had three ODIs against New Zealand. That was our international calendar. <laughs> and now it's, it's, yeah, it's moved. I would have had to have played three, maybe four years for the volume of cricket that they're playing in this summer, England. So it's very exciting. Um, yeah, and it's great to be a part of. Well, that just shows how and much the women's game Mel changed. Fear has a Mel Fear has a lot to answer for. I've only done two podcasts and you're the second because I usually don't do a lot of this stuff. <laughs> so it's well, not what – so Mel's um, – she's done well. Well, it's been a pleasure to, to talk to you this morning. Mel does listen to the podcast, so I'm sure she will listen to this one. I might have to split this one up into two podcasts um, so you, people will get uh, two two chances to listen to uh, Lisa Kitely, the England women's cricket coach. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. Looking for a fun way to win 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash play100 and use code play100. That's code play100 at prizepicks.com slash play100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy.